Remember this replica 1581 drive I built a while back? Well, I broke it. Let's see how badly I screwed up and what we can do to fix it right now on Retro Bits. Where we last left off with this replica 1581 is that I had three tasks that I wanted to complete before I was going to consider this project a success. The first of which was to get a better fit and finish on the eject button. And so I've reprinted it using the Amiga 500 color matched PLA filament. And I think it came out really, really good. The color match is really close to this 1581 front bezel. So I'm quite happy with the texture and the color there. The next task was to remove the always on LED from the front of this PC drive that I was using, which I did. And then finally, to create a custom length power cable for inside of the drive, which you can see here. Having completed all of those, I buttoned it back up and did an initial power on test and verified that the LED activity lights came on and did their thing, everything looked good. So I put it back on the shelf and I forgot about it. Here's where things start to get weird. Recently, I had been contacted by Tim of Tim's Retro Corner. He and three other UK-based YouTubers had recently built their own 1581 replicas using several of the different PCB designs available today. Every single one of their finished drives were having issues. Occasionally things would work, but more often than not, they would fail to read and throw a 74 drive not ready error. Curious to see if I could replicate the issue, I pulled my own drive off the shelf and hooked it up. It had worked flawlessly when I first built it, but suddenly I was seeing the same drive not ready error. Had I just been cursed over the internet? So what could have changed since I built my replica? Because it was working. I thought about it for a little bit, and then I remembered that a lot of PC three and a half inch drives do suffer from bad capacitors. So maybe it's possible that in the interim between when I built it and when I tested it recently, the capacitors on the board had gone bad. So I opened it up and I found that it does indeed have two electrolytic capacitors, one here and one there. And so I desoldered them and I tested them out on my capacitor tester and they were both out of spec. So I replaced them with new units, put the drive back together and it still didn't work in the 1581. So I dug out my stash of old PC three and a half inch drives and I tested each and every one of them and not a single one of them worked. What the heck is going on with this 1581? Next, I hooked up this GoTech drive running the flash floppy firmware and that worked perfectly fine, which is the same thing that a lot of people have been reporting who have built these replicas lately, that the GoTech worked fine, but none of the PC drives they tried were reliable. So what else have I done since it last worked? I mean, the most recent thing I did was to build this power cable. So I guess we can look at that. Well, I'm looking at the cable here and it looks fine to me. Pin one is red and that's plus five volts. Pin four is yellow and that's plus 12 volts. And if we flip it around, the same story on the other side. So yeah, that all looks good to me. Let's take a look at the interface board that converts the PC drive for use with an Amiga or the Commodore 1581. We'll plug in our cable here. And yeah, pin one is red and that's plus five five volts, uh-oh. Same goes for the power connector. Pin one carries five volts and pin four carries 12, so don't get them backwards. Huh, I guess I should have listened to myself. Well, I must have fried the logic board on each and every one of these PC drives that I plugged in since I've made this power cable. Well, that sucks. It's actually not the cable's fault. I did that right. So it turns out I just soldered this connector on backwards when I originally built this adapter board and I was using regular wires with DuPont style connectors. So I just made sure that plus five volts went to pin one on the drive and everything worked fine until I built this cable. Now, talk about past Matt messing everything up for present day Matt, jeez. Well, I got on eBay and I bought myself another drive. It was only $8 plus shipping. And it's actually the exact same model as the one I had been previously using. So now I have to decide, 
do I want to fix up the adapter and continue to use this? Or do I want to modify the PC drive so it works directly with the Amiga and 1581 without any adapter board? Well, for what it's worth, the power connector wasn't the only thing I screwed up. If we look here on the ribbon cable, pin 1 is denoted by this red stripe and the connector is keyed. Well, pin 1's over here on the adapter, and if we plug this in the only way it fits, yeah, pin 1 is not where pin 1 is. So, this doesn't matter if the drive itself isn't keyed, but if it is, this isn't going to work. So, you know, this is just sloppy, sloppy, sloppy. Now, I could try and desolder everything and put it all back together the right way, but the through holes are really tiny, so I'd have to use hot air, and if I did that, I'd probably melt these plastic pieces. I don't have any spare PCBs to build, so you know what? I think I'm just gonna write this off, and we'll just modify the drive instead. The new drive is a Samsung SFD-321B, the same model that I used in the original build, but recently destroyed. Yeah, I'm still kicking myself for that. This model appears to be very common and was used by OEMs like Compact in a lot of systems. The drive supports 880K low density, also called double density disks, like those used by the Amiga and 1581. Amiga machines can be upgraded to use high density drives and later models like the 4000 were even fitted with them as standard. But for today's exercise, we're not interested in that. Because this particular model could be found in a lot of different systems, there were many variants available with different faceplates, LEDs, etc. But the options weren't limited to the purely cosmetic, as we'll see shortly. Of interest is that this drive doesn't use the 12 volt pin on the Mini Molex connector at all, and this whole mess could have probably been avoided if I'd left the header off the PCB in the first place. Oh well. For what it's worth, I've already tested this new drive in a PC just to ensure that we're starting from a known good point. Right, so what's the difference between a PC drive and a Commodore drive anyway? The first change is with the drive select signal. A PC expects drives to identify themselves with DS1 and uses a twist in the ribbon cable to remap the signal. A 1581 or Amiga on the other hand expect DS0 to be used and have straight cables with no twist. Next, the PC expects to see a disk change signal on pin 34 of the cable. Commodore drives instead send the ready to access signal on this pin. PCs don't use the RDY signal at all, instead using disk change to imply a ready state. Finally, on pin 2, the PC expects to be told whether a high or low density disk is being used, but as the Amiga only uses the latter, that signal isn't needed, so disk change from pin 34 can be found here instead. All right, we've got a plan, so let's get this thing taken apart. Let's start with the drive select signal. As I alluded to earlier, the Samsung unit provides a host of configuration options and gives us a way to configure the setting directly on the PCB. All right, so to change from the PC's drive select one to the Amiga's drive select zero, all we have to do is remove this solder blob and move it over to this pad instead. So that's what I'm gonna do. All right, that was really easy. Let's just clean it up and then I'll make sure I don't have a solder bridge and that the pads are not connected. Okay, we're good, moving on. Almost as if they had this use case in mind, the Samsung drive also lets us easily configure whether we want the disk change or ready signal on pin 34. All right, the next thing we wanna do is the pin 34, which we can find right here, we wanna change it from the disk change signal on the PC to the ready to access signal on the Amiga. And if we follow it here, it's controlled by this block of jumpers. And we have a zero ohm resistor here on disk change, and we just need to desolder that and move it over to the RDY block instead. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put down a little bit of flux here to help me try and remove this 
without causing too much damage. And then I'll try and desolder it first and lift that out without damaging any pads. That's the idea anyway. Yeah, that didn't work too great. So I think what I'm gonna do is just try it with a soldering iron and see if I can lift each side one at a time. Okay, no, nope, that wasn't great. So let me put a little more flux on and I will try it with some desoldering braid instead. There we go. Okay, that wasn't as easy as I thought it was gonna be. But we got there in the end. Let me clean it up a bit more. All right, and to put it into the new location, I'm just going to add solder to one of the pads. And just like a surface mount cap, I'm gonna slide the part in with the solder melted again. Just flip it around to get easier access. And there we go. Step two complete. And once again, let's verify we did it correctly. First of all, so we have continuity between the pads and continuity to pin 34. All right, we're good. All that's left now is to map pin two to the disc change signal coming out of the controller chip here on the pad that we just disconnected. So pin two is connected to this solder blob here which controls the density for the PC. I'm gonna remove this solder blob and then run a jumper wire from this pad over to this pad and then we should be done. For my jumper, I'm just gonna use this little piece of wire wrap wire here. All right, and let's make sure that we didn't bridge this with our wire. Looks good. That we have a connection to the drive change. We do, and that pin two. doesn't connect all the way across. Interesting, pin two connects here or here. Oh dear, I've got it connected to the wrong pad. We need to move it to this pad. This is pin two, whoops, no big deal. There we go. Let's try that again. Once again, let's make sure we don't have continuity. We have continuity to pin two, and pin two has continuity to drive change. Disc change. Nice, we're good to go. And for a finishing touch, I will just take a piece of Kapton tape and stick down my wire like that, just so that it's secure. All right, let's test this thing out. Oh, but before we do that, one final thought. I read online that we need to make sure this in-use NHDD jumper is not connected, and on our drive, it is not connected. But on some PC drives, other people have found this to be connected, and that can cause a problem. So you'll need to remove those jumpers if your drive has that. You know what, before we move on, our old drive had bad electrolytic capacitors, so let me just replace them while we're in here. There's only two of them, and they are 47 microfarad at 25 volt. So let's just do that as cheap insurance. And of course I would have put the wire right where the capacitor is. <laughs> All right, got my tester here. Remember these are 47 microfarad. Let's see what they test out to.
All right, 44.46 microfarad, but 2.3 ohm ESR, which is high. So that could stand to be replaced. Let's try this other one. And this one says it's short. Maybe that's me. Let me try again. Just make sure I've got the legs part. Okay, nope, this one's good. 45.15 microfarad, 0.82 ESR. So this cap is good. The other one has a high uh, equivalent series resistance. So I'm gonna replace them both. Another cheap insurance is to clean the read right head. So I'm just gonna put some IPA on a cotton bud and get in there. Get the top one and the bottom one. Double-sided drive, of course. Yep, it wasn't dirty. There's nothing on the, the Q-tip here. And finally, one last maintenance item is the lubricant on the drive screw here. Now I took a look at it and as you can see, it's this green stuff right there. And it is nice and supple and there's still plenty of it. You can see how easily it smears around and there's lots of it on the screw. So I am not gonna remove or replace that. We're just gonna call it good. I think now we're finally ready to test. You know, I think I'd lose my head if it wasn't attached to my shoulders. There is another thing we need to do, and that is to remove this LED because this will always be on. The drive is always selected when it's on the Commodore 1581. Yeah, and we don't want that on our 1581. Okay, now we're really ready to test. Of course, the ultimate destination of this modified drive is going to be in the Replica 1581, but since I made the changes for an Amiga, let's try it out in one, first of all, and see if it works. Now, this 1200, isn't it a beauty? Look how clean this thing is. Came to me from Glenn at the CRG, the Casual Retro Gamer on YouTube. If you haven't seen his channel, check it out, link in the description. He does a lot of Amiga content and other stuff, so yeah, check his channel out, and thank you, Glenn, for this lovely Amiga 1200. Let me get this opened up, and then we can throw the drive in and see if it works. All right, there we go. I've got the new drive just sitting on top of the old one and plugged in with the original harness. So let me get a monitor hooked up, and we'll try it out. All right, got the system up and running here. Drive is connected. We're booted to the workbench on the hard drive. And the nice thing about the system is it came with all of the pack-in titles as well. And so we've got Deluxe Paint and we've got a couple different games and things in here. So let me just throw in Deluxe Paint into the drive and see what happens. It's reading. Cool, we've got the disc icon on the desktop. Let's see. And it looks like it's working. <laughs> First try, can you believe it? Awesome. Thank you internet for instructions on how to do just about anything. All right, let's try something else. We've got a game here. I think this is a booter game, so I'm going to take the deluxe paint out, throw this in, and let's just reboot the system. Oh, there it goes. I'm gonna call that a success. Let me transplant the drive into the 1581 and we'll test that out next. All right, so I've got the drive loosely installed in the 1581 and just so there's no confusion, pin one is red and that's plus five volts. Pin four is yellow and that's plus 12 volts. We can see it there on the board. And then pin one goes to here, five volts on pin one and pin four labeled here on the drive is yellow for 12 volts. Now this drive does not use 12 volts, so I could just remove that wire entirely for safety purposes, and I may yet do that, just so there's no confusion in the future. All right, got my Commodore 128 set up here with the drive just loosely installed, running 80 column mode like you should, and we've got a Lodestar 128 here. Let's throw that in the new drive. And it's Jiffy DOS, so I can just hit F1. Drive seeking, directories loading. Perfect, so we've got a functional 1581 again. 
I'm really happy about that, guys. After how many drives I killed testing this thing, uh, just such a simple thing, and I feel so stupid for it. All right, so the next test is to change the disc and see if it recognizes the disc change, because that's a problem the other guys have been having with their 1581 replicas. Yep, it's showing GEOS 128 as the disc header, so that's working. Let's just see if we can load GEOS 128 from this. Sounds like it's working. And there it goes. We are loading GEOS. It's nice and quiet, too. This is quieter than my last drive. All right, guys, I think I'm going to call this a success. We have a fully functional drive and we're not using the adapter at all. So this PC drive has been converted to the Amiga and the 1581 with no problems. Awesome. All right, one last thing before we can call this project a complete success. And that is that apparently not all Samsung SFD 321B drives have the same physical geometry. The old drive worked just fine in this 1581 housing, but the new drive, if I insert a disc here and press eject, the disc binds up in the housing. It can't clear the front faceplate of the 1581. In order to correct that issue, I modified and reprinted the drive sled, and the new version is three millimeters shorter than the original. And with that done, the drive is all buttoned up and ready for service. My 1581 is as good as new, and I'm a happy camper again, even though I did ruin five drives in the process. Perhaps I'll be more careful in the future. So what about Tim and the others who are still having issues with their builds? Well, it seems like the replica board from Tomza One on Forum 64 DE that I used in my build just works. Other enhanced replica boards that came out shortly thereafter seem to be the ones with issues. At the time this video was released, the specific problem has yet to be identified, so keep that in mind before you decide to build one of your own. Also, check out Tim's Retro Corner for updates on the situation and his two 1581 builds. The link is in the description. Keep in mind that the process I showed today is specific to the Samsung SFD321B, but the theory behind it applies to other PC drives as well. Well, I'm still mad at myself, but all's well that ends well, and we got to learn something new in the process. What's your worst retro screw up? Let us know in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this bit. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Retro Bits.